about a little bit more what each joint uh, is driven by, what muscles move each joint. In this schematic drawing, we've identified all the muscles that can be active at any of the joints, and I've listed them in order of what muscle tends to be more dominant. At the PIP joint, the dominance for extension is, as we said before, usually the interosseous if the MP is extended, but it may be the lumbrical. But in the normal finger, the last power is extensor digitorum communis. In the joints here on this drawing, which have multiple muscles listed, the dominance of one muscle over another may change based on position or load. This is not a static, absolute description of muscle power. It's an interplay, therefore diff more difficult to understand because it is so complex. At the interphalangeal joints here, I'm using this schematic drawing to identify in the red the power contribution of the extensor digitorum communis, in blue the power contribution of the interosseous muscles, and the power contribution of the lumbrical muscle. You can see that all three muscles, which do contribute to finger extension, are active during full finger extension. And all of them are pulling proximally to allow interphalangeal joint extension. The role of the lumbrical is unique and I would encourage you to review the series on finger motion to have a greater appreciation of the unique aspect of the lumbrical contribution. Now let's look specifically at the extensor digitorum communis, mainly because one of the ideas that I'm putting forth in this presentation is that we can harness the extensor digitorum communis to be more powerful at the PIP joint. The central slip is the main central portion of the dorsal apparatus. It is not a separate tendon, it is part of the tissues, and it does end just distal to the PIP and inserts into the base of the middle phalanx. However, if I took a normal finger and I was able to take a scalpel and go underneath this dorsal apparatus and simply incise that insertion, the central slip insertion, disconnect it, but I leave the dorsal apparatus intact, finger motion would be absolutely normal. In other words, the central slip insertion alone is not what extends the PIP joint. The tension of the dorsal apparatus and the proximal movement of the entire dorsal apparatus is just as important as a central slip insertion. The reason we see problems when the central slip insertion is avulsed is because there is a tear in the continuity of the dorsal apparatus at the same time. If the dorsal apparatus is intact, that central slip insertion is not functionally important. In the upper right photograph here, I am pulling proximally on the extensor digitorum communis on a cadaver specimen. And you can see clearly the role of the extensor digitorum communis when no other muscles are active. There is MP joint extension or hyperextension there is not full PIP extension, only slight and very slight DIP extension. That is because the extensor digitorum communis pull would first come to the metacarpal phalangeal joint via the sagittal band insertion and only after the MP joint is extended can the force then be transmitted more distally to contribute to both DIP and PIP joint extension. The conclusion would be that the extensor digitorum communis must first extend the MP joint before any power is available for PIP joint extension. As we previously said, in the normal finger, 
the extensor digitorum communis will contribute to interphalangeal joint extension once the MP joint is extended. But when there's resistance at the PIP joint, then the MP joint becomes hyperextended. And the extensor digitorum communis is now all concentrated at the MP joint and has no effect and cannot help at the PIP joint. One reason that we have such great difficulty in helping patients regain extension at the PIP joint, this is particularly true on the little finger. There are a number of anatomical reasons that the little finger is more difficult to regain PIP extension, one of which is the hypermobility of both the CMC joint, meaning the base of the metacarpal, as well as the MP joint on the little finger. You'll find that those joints are much looser than the other joints of the other metacarpals. That makes it more difficult to stabilize them and transmit power distally. Extensor digitorum communis doesn't really extend the DIP joint alone, but it does have a contribution, but that contribution is indirect. As it goes out distally, it goes laterally, connects with the lateral band, and then that force is transmitted to the DIP joint. But part of extending the DIP joint is the contribution to extend the PIP joint, because as the dorsal apparatus moves proximally, both of those joints are simultaneously extended. The clawing of the MP joint with a contraction of the EDC is the single largest problem in regaining full PIP joint extension. There is no longer a balance of motion. And no matter what maneuver is done to the PIP joint, if the resistance is not decreased there, the patient will continue with this pattern of motion. It's inevitable. The MP joint hyperextension is actually our greatest enemy toward regaining PIP joint extension. Let's look at this schematically. Let's look at the primary power of the extensor digitorum communis, which is to extend the metacarpal phalangeal joints through the sagittal band fibers which surround the joint, connecting with the extensor digitorum communis, but they surround the joint and insert into the volar plate. So when the extensor digitorum muscle contracts, the metacarpal phalangeal joint extends. And it is only after that extension, or as that is extending and moving proximally, is force transmitted more distally. And that force is a secondary force, because the sagittal band fibers first must move proximally for this force to occur distally. There is a somewhat direct force to the central slip insertion, but there's also a force through the conjoined lateral bands to the lateral band to the DIP joint. Again, the interconnection that we frequently talk about. Another way, perhaps, to think about the extensor digitorum communis very simplistically is consider metacarpal phalangeal joint extension and interphalangeal joint extension. The extensor digitorum communis is extending the MP joint, but by the proximal movement, actually what the EDC is doing is tensioning the dorsal apparatus. It's taking the slack out of it. This is very important because the excursion of the extensor digitorum communis muscle tendon unit is much greater than the intrinsic muscles. So if the EDC takes the slack out of the dorsal apparatus. Now the interosseous muscles, with a very small amount of excursion, and the lumbrical muscle with uh, significantly more excursion than the interosseous, but still relatively small, both of those smaller muscles can now be effective in moving the dorsal apparatus with less excursion. 
So it is indeed this marriage between the balance of these muscles that creates full finger extension. So I would say that the extensor digitorum communis contributes to PIP joint extension, except when the metacarpal phalangeal joint is hyperextended. But the most important consideration is that the EDC has the power to fully extend the interphalangeal joints if we prevent the metacarpal phalangeal joint from full extension. We drive the power into the interphalangeal joints. This is a key point useful in considering how we can mobilize stiff PIP joints into extension. Let's utilize the power of this extrinsic extensor to fully extend the interphalangeal joints until the resistance at the joints is equal to that at the MP joint and then the patient is able to regain the balance of motion. The extensor digitorum communis, power comes to the MP joint, but if we block the proximal phalanx and do not allow it to extend, now we're driving the power more distally. We're harnessing the power just as we harness horses, and we're telling the horses which way to turn and which way to pull. We're doing the same thing by blocking MP joint hyperextension. We know this, we see this, and we've proven this in patients who have developed PIP flexion contractures in the ring and little fingers secondary to clawing from ulnar palsy. When they are fitted with an anti-claw orthosis such as this, and they begin to have the MP joint hyperextension blocked, they regain full PIP joint extension even though the PIP joint was limited passively at the time of the orthotic application. The repetitive active motion drives the power to the PIP joint. We know this works with patients with ulnar palsy. Why would it not also work with patients with a stiff PIP joint? We will certainly discuss this further. The one point that I also did not want to forget was to remind us that if one muscle is missing in the dorsal apparatus, it's very easy for the other muscles to take over and to contribute enough to get the job done. The dorsal apparatus is not dependent upon any one muscle power. It is dependent upon a balance of muscle power. Mm -hmm.